Well, good morning from California to, uh, I guess we could say good morning to the Pacific, to Hawaii. And uh, good afternoon to, <clears throat> excuse me, the rest of the states and good evening to uh, points further east or farther east. This is the Wisdom of the Soul class. This is number 16. And we're going to continue today to develop the, uh, the concepts that we introduced last week as a uh, as spiritual discontent, uh, the desire nature, divine homesickness, and uh, another phrase that uh, I personally like, the longing of the heart to be whole. What is longing? What do we mean by longing? And I'm going to um, expound on that a little bit. Look forward to taking your questions at the top of the hour, uh, about 50 minutes from now. And uh, we'll begin with an opening meditation. And I know a lot of you uh, um, look forward to this. <laughs> this may be your, your favorite part of our Sunday morning meeting. So if you get comfortable in your chairs, uh, some of you may be on meditation pillows in a formal yoga position, but that's certainly not necessary. We're, we're Westerners. So sit up in your chair. Again, the idea is to sit erect, shoulders back, chin up. Think of yourself as balanced. You don't want to be rigid but nicely stacked, head above shoulders, above hips, and allow the chair to support you. As you close your eyes and begin to create and sense a feeling of relaxation, feel the chair supporting you and let go into the trust that you have that your chair is not going to fall apart. <laughs> it's not going to drop you any more than the floor would open up. Silly as it may sound, remind yourself that you need not hold your body together. You can let go of tension and your arms and legs will not fly off your body. Just let go. Consider how much effort we put into living our lives, the tendency that we have to micromanage. And what if we began to let go of some of that concern as well? And consider that maybe life knows what it's doing and that we can take it on its own terms and let go in that sense. Take two or three nice, slow, deep breaths at your own pace, with your own rhythm, pulling in strength and power as you inhale. And as you exhale, create a letting go feeling. And do that several times. Nice, slow, deep breathing. Feeling yourself becoming more and more relaxed, safer, still, and more calm. As you allow your breathing to return to autopilot, Just let your body breathe itself. And it's always a good idea to begin any meditation and every meditation 
with a kind of a welcoming in. Whether you feel wonderful or you've had better days, maybe emotionally, things aren't quite right for you. Maybe physically, there's some discomfort. I'd like you to be present with whatever you feel, emotionally or physically. Consider that the unconditional love that we've heard so much about is unconditional everything. that feelings, whether they're sad or otherwise hurtful emotionally or painful physically, are signals and that we benefit from being aware of those signals. just as surely as we benefit from feeling great, feeling happy and joyful, to enjoy this moment is to be filled with joy, to rejoice. Joy is happiness for no reason. Happiness, even if you feel sad. Happiness, even if you have some discomfort. Happiness, even if your feelings are mixed and you can't quite put your finger on what's going on. Welcome it in anyway. to refuse to do so, to resist these feelings, to avoid them. They make sense on the surface. But we'd be missing the message. It's like covering over the dashboard of your car in hopes that if you can't see the gauges or the red lights flashing, then nothing can happen to the car or maybe you'll just turn the radio up real loud if you can't hear the banging and the clanging and the buzzing and other indications that your car is having a problem. Well, just turn the radio up, then nothing could possibly happen. And as foolish as that would be, that's what we do when we seek to avoid to repress or push away from, to resist in any way our emotional feelings and our physical senses and sensations. As you become more and more relaxed, scanning your body slowly from head to toe, creating and sensing a wonderful feeling of relaxation. Remind yourself reality is a safe place to live your life. Acceptance is where we begin. It's not the end of things. Acceptance is not surrender, give up, throw in the towel. Acceptance is to acknowledge reality. Each of you are spiritual warriors, albeit in training. We're made for this. You are beings of love and light and cannot be extinguished.
while your physical presence is mortal, your spirit is everlasting. Just as all energy cannot be created nor destroyed, but lives infinitely and eternally, so too do each of us in all things as energy, as spirit. Continue on. In reality, you see, taking life on its own terms is a safe place to live and play. Affirm that. I am safe. My body is still. My mind is becoming more and more quiet. My emotional nature is becoming more and more calm. And I stand open and receptive to everything life has to offer. without judging it as good or bad, getting better or getting worse. It simply is what it is. Place your attention on the bottom of your nose And simply become aware of your body breathing itself. Become curious. And identify as the watcher rather than the breather. Release control. of your breathing. Stand back, sit back, and notice how the body breathes itself all by itself. And simply note, this is the in-breath, this is the out-breath. Breathing in and breathing out. Consider that there is no wrong way to breathe. <clears throat> There's no better way to breathe or worse way to breathe. There are many ways to breathe. But there is no need to judge them. Simply witness the breathing without judgment. If this breath watching was the only meditation you ever did, it would suffice. Be 
Because in these levels of deep relaxation and peace of mind, we begin to cultivate an awareness of non-attachment. You let go of your need for things to be this way and not that way. And just let it be. What if the natural world, the natural world, knew what it was doing and things unfolded as they should, whether we understand all of the comings and goings or not, just consider the possibility that without micromanaging, without struggling, without crawling and scratching and scraping our way. We'd get pretty much the same results. The vast majority of our concerns about what might happen never do come to fruition, do they? So much of life is like a rocking chair. Seems you're doing a lot of work, putting a lot of effort into the rocking, burning a lot of calories, but you're really not getting anywhere. And no matter how frenetic and how worrisome you're rocking. When it's over, you stand up, you're exactly where you were. The world still spins. The moon revolves around it as we journey around the sun. What if you knew or were at least willing to consider that the natural world has no problems? That what we call problems are conceptions in the minds of men and women. A perception, a consideration, a concern. A notion that we know better about how things should go. than the entirety of the universe. And that we should limit all of the possibilities in our lives through our considerations. And rarely do we consider them as limitations. We think of them as dreaming up new possibilities, but the possibilities are unlimited without the wishing. So in fact, our desire nature 
are wishing, are hoping, are praying, are petitioning for this or that, there's really a set of limitations as if we know better what's in our interest. <clears throat> and what needs to be done, what has to happen, or something horrible will befall us. Well, what if that's not true? We have volition, we have will. We can form an intention and follow through decisions and to some extent judgments even must be made. But do we have to go as far as we go? Do we really need to micromanage our lives? To sign off on every little bit? To be in control always? How much stress and anxiety how much sadness and depression could we give up if we just trusted our lives to unfold as they should? And go back to watching your breathing if you've left that. Notice how your life is sustained effortlessly by breath. By your beating heart. By the digesting of your breakfast. And the maintenance of my goodness blood pressure, pulse, body temperature, the immune system, the neurology of awareness, your body growing and repairing and continually replacing cells that have spent themselves and need to be replaced all on its own. Let go into that. Will the flowers and the trees worry? Are the animals concerned? Do they wonder what will I do? How will I solve this problem? How will I manage my emotions? Is there anything in nature that is not beautiful? perfectly balanced, exactly as it should be, unique in every way, unique. No two snowflakes alike, no two butterflies, no two flowers, no two people. You have DNA proof of your uniqueness. No two days in your life are exactly alike. No two breaths are exactly alike. Be open to that. It's effortless. It's effortless. Feel that letting go, feel that peace.
and bring what you've become aware of and the feelings that go with it with you back into the room as you reorient yourself. And usually meditators just open their eyes when they're done. I think it's a great idea to count yourself out. One to three, one to five, maybe. And begin by simply, as I said, reorienting yourself and forming the intention to come back to the wide awake state. And to feel yourself moving toward that wide awake state, remembering the room in which you sit, feeling the chair supporting you and the floor beneath your feet. And now open your eyes, wide awake, alert, eyes open, wide awake, feeling great, feeling better than before, back in the room, feeling fine. Happy, healthy, refreshed, and revitalized. Big breath now. Ah, I always think a nice stretch is good. Ah, like you're just waking up in the morning, you know, ah, back in the body. Hello, here we are. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. I want to pick up where we left off last week um, with this idea of divine homesickness. And I want to dwell on it because I think it's such a profound, uh, what shall I say, entry point or a foundation for us to build an understanding that is, well, really fundamental to, to all of this work. What is spiritual development? What is personal development? What's that mean? We grow on our own, right? Yeah, we get smarter. We become more aware little by little. We learn lessons. We have experiences we draw upon. We read. We chat with other people. We get better. We grow in spite of ourselves. despite our fears. But if that's central to our existence, if I dare say the purpose of life is to grow, to evolve, to unfold, and it certainly appears to be wherever you turn, if you reflect upon it a little bit, then why not get with the program and accelerate our growth? First as human beings, and then as spiritual beings. The wisdom of the soul suggests there is an exalted intelligence and awareness, a wisdom, insight, understanding, truth, love, beauty, goodness, that overshadows us, that stands above us, that in a sense, the soul is already in heaven. I'm not sure the church, any religion, any organized human institution is going to tell you that because their position is pretty much to take the place of the soul and to stand between you and self-realization so that you have to come through the church and its rules and its tenets and its beliefs and its dogma and its ceremony. And in exchange, you get fellowship and you get the idea of worship. Boy, that's a whole class unto itself. What is worship? What does that even mean? I was reading an essay this week about God fearing. And in the same essay, talking about the importance of loving God, God loving and God fearing seems to be 
two sides of the same coin. We're supposed to love what we fear and know that what we ought to fear truly loves us until it doesn't. And then we're cast into hell for all times. Too many questions, right? That's why we're here. That's why we call ourselves spiritual, but not religious. I've even used the term secular spirituality, <laughs> which is a deliberate contradiction in terms. Can we approach questions of awareness, meaning and purpose, drawing upon religious tenets, but standing outside of them and, and beyond them. Metaphysics means beyond and behind physics. Meta-awareness, metacognition, beyond or behind awareness or cognition. Meta-religion, there's more. There's a, a comparative view of religion and still more. You know, if you studied biology and called yourself a biologist, you wouldn't think of that as a religion. So why would morality and ethics and virtue be the sole domain of organized religion? Do we not have a conscience? Religion as a support group, I think, is a great idea. But each of us has to maintain personal responsibility for our awareness of who we are and why we exist and what we do and how we go about it. And what comes up again and again whether you think of it as religion or philosophy or psychology or sociology, is I need to make a contribution to the world. Uh, and in order to do that, I want to grow and be better to be of greater service and to maximize my contribution to the world. Do you want to leave the world a slightly better place than you found it? Or do you want to just take get what you can, make your Z and split. You know, I'm a backpacker and, and a car camper. Uh, I left car camping because I was surrounded by Winnebago's and, and <laughs> people in a campsite watching TV and air conditioned comfort didn't make sense to me. Why are you here? Why'd you spend $150,000 on that Winnebago and say you're a camper. So I headed off into the woods with a sack over my shoulder. Looking for life on its own terms. And there's an ethic in camping about leaving the campsite that you make for yourself better than you found it. And uh, I don't know any backpacker that if they came upon a scrap of paper or some litter would pick it up and stick it in their pocket. Why do we stop doing that in the city? I have a friend who uh, lives in Virginia. He's 82, maybe 85 in his early 80s, mid 80s, old timer. And he goes for a walk every day two, three miles, and uh, he picks up trash. That's what he does. That's what he does. That's that, <laughs> he's a brilliant man. He's a member of Mensa. He's a genius. Um, and, and what does he do? He picks up trash because he can. Somebody's got to do it, right? So are you going to be the one that casts the trash or the one that picks it up? Are you here just for yourself or are we here to make the world better? Are we willing to uh, face our despair 
and the fear is that there's no hope and continue on because it's it's our nature to want to grow and evolve and contribute it's really that simple and that drive that motivation is part of this longing that we began to talk about last week the divine homesickness what a wonderful phrase again i want to give attribution to the psychologist the psychotherapist roberto assagioli he, he actually coined or developed his own approach to psychotherapy called psychosynthesis which you can google and read about but he was also a theosophist and uh, coined this phrase divine homesickness for the spiritual discontent that we feel the longing that leads people to conclude that there must be a god and if not a being on a cloud a superhuman out there someplace that we can petition and ask for grace and special favors like in high school the friday night football game you know and both teams pray to God for victory, and we're supposed to believe that this divine being, this creator of the universe, is deciding who should win the Friday night football game at the high school. When we do that with war, God is on our side, but of course, the enemy, as brutal as they are, knows that a different God is on their side. Their God's the good God. Our God is the false God. We oddly mirror that same perception about our God is the good God. Yours is the false God. So why don't we get together and kill each other? Christians and Jews and Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists. Why don't we just all get together and kill each other over this? So there's something very wrong here. We seem to be missing something. This longing in the heart, this feeling of I'm not whole yet. The heart's longing to be whole can be called love. But it's not merely a sentiment. It's not merely emotional affinity love is consciousness love is awareness at least when we capitalize right capital l love and it's this longing that we have to make a contribution to be more to pursue virtue to uh, to domesticate our animal nature and cultivate our spiritual nature. For again, we are both animal and spirit. We are physical, material beings, animals, illumined and animated by an energy, a spirit, a breath. Sometimes we behave like animals. Sometimes our behavior is more refined and we become compassionate, empathetic, kind, loving, generous, forgiving, merciful, tolerant, patient, humorous, able to appreciate beauty everywhere in all things. And 
there's a kind of a tug of war going, isn't there? And like, we're the rope. We're getting pulled this way and that way. Getting pulled in one direction, maybe pushed in another direction. I'm not sure how you frame it or how you look at it, but this is the struggle, the, the archetype of the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder. I remember, uh, <laughs> I'm dating myself, but that old uh, movie with uh, John Belushi, Animal House, there was a scene where they literally had a, a guy with an angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other soldier, uh, shoulder. And um, the debate is raging, like who wins? We, we all know that struggle. So who are we? Well, we're both. Well, what are you going to do with that? You're going to aspire to be more animal-like, more visceral, more carnal, more self-centered, and live a life that's just for you. What can I get out of this? Money and power. Not the power of love, but the power of domination, the power of money the power of leverage, the power of threat and ultimatum. That's the power that the rich and the powerful seek. It's the power to control the world. That's what, that's what most people want. But there's another power, obviously, a subtler power that moves in the other direction, away from the animal nature, toward virtue, uh, a more refined view of what we can give to others and do for others and how we can help others and, 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 and heal and learn and grow and expand. And that's where the joy is, of course. That's where the real lasting fulfillment is. The, the principles of impermanence in philosophy are quite profound to to realize, especially when we've been enculturated to be consumers in this materialistic world, consume, consume, earn and spend, earn and spend. I like, to, I like buying stuff, I like acquiring stuff, but at the same time, you know, recognize that the fulfillment never lasts. <laughs> That's the trick, is to get hip to the game. As soon as you get what you want, we touched on this last week. It's an important concept. As soon as you get what you want, you feel this wonderful sense of fulfillment. Yay. I mean, it could be a material thing, like a new car or a new, uh, in my case, it might be a new guitar, right? Or some computer device or high tech piece of magic, right? Some really cool software. I'm always in search of, uh, uh, audio editing software, I collect it, I love it, <laughs> it's all different. But then you get it and, and your desire nature is satisfied only for a matter of hours or days at most, and then it's replaced by another desire, you start shopping around. You can see it in relationships, you can see it in material acquisition, it just never lasts. So dream your dreams, Go after what it is that you need, whatever you wish. Just be hip to the trick that there is no there there. There is no lasting fulfillment as long as we pursue things of this world. Christ said, store your riches in heaven and not on earth. What does that mean? It means to respond to this longing, this divine homesickness by reorienting ourselves away from the affairs of the world. Again, you got to live in the world. You got to have an income. You got bills you got to pay. You, you need clothes, a car that starts. I get it. A decent shelter, food. Even these things are getting increasingly difficult. 
but that can't be the end of it. You're here because you know this. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm looking for new ways to express this and encourage this, you know, like underscore it. And to turn away from this animal nature and address this divine homesickness by beginning to find the path and walk the path home again. Life's a big circle. So I want you to consider spiritual separation anxiety as another way of talking about this. This longing of the heart to be whole, this spiritual discontent, this divine homesickness. as a, a motive that has great rewards, peace of mind, happiness, joy, fulfillment. This sometimes is described as bliss. I think that may be overstated. I don't know how blissful uh, or how long you can hold that idea of bliss, but it's better than fear and stress and anxiety and believing that your life is about material acquisition and being a consumer. Trust me, you, you spend your whole life acquiring stuff. You spend the last third of your life dragging it to the curb on trash day. Uh, I'm still doing my life stuff. <laughs> We went to Hawaii, we dumped so much stuff in the dumpster. We came back from Hawaii five years later. We spent two days at the uh, uh, recycling center, the dump, whatever you want to call it. Michael. Lightening our load, yeah. 11.55. Thanks, sweetie. So how do we put our feet directly on this path? of spiritual unfoldment? How do we uh, align ourselves with this spiritual longing? It starts simply by recognizing that the desire nature is not merely for material stuff and not simply for relationships. It's for connection because we feel as if we're separate. We feel alienated and we reach out in hopes of connecting. Why do you have animals? Why do you have cats and dogs or bunny rabbits or goldfish or lizards or snakes or birds in a cage or, or whatever. Well, in most cases, it's to touch them or to be in their presence. We call them pets because we want to pet them, which we enjoy and they enjoy. Dogs and cats will roll over and expose their belly to you. This is more nerves, feels wonderful to get your belly rubbed or your back or shoulders or anything else. Say animals are no different from us. They find that pleasurable. We call them pets. We want the contact because we feel alienated and alone. And buying stuff as cool as it is. Oh my God, I got a new car. I'm so stoked. Far out, I'm happy for you, but that's not going to fulfill you. Say, so, well, get a dog or a cat. Get in a loving relationship where there's physical touch involved. Make that connection. Still, that's not enough either, is it? Well, I need some conversation. I need some engagement. I need to be spiritually uplifted by a conversation with intelligent Oh, passionate and compassionate people. I need that connection. 
I need some feedback on my views and my thoughts and my feelings. I need connection. All of this desire, we have to elevate it and recognize what it really is. What it ultimately is, is a divine homesickness and the desire not to be separate. The good news is separation is an illusion. You're not separate. And this is where material desire comes from. And this is where the belief that there has to be a God comes from. We can feel it in our hearts that we're all one. We're all connected. That's what love is. Again, not merely eros or, or romantic love, but something much more refined. A sense that I am that and that and that and that we're all springing from a common source. And what's that got to do with religion? You know, somebody's going to create a religion of quantum physics. There, there already is religious science and science of mind. <laughs> Scientology. <laughs> Somebody tried to make a tology and ontology out of science. Uh, I've got a whole riff on Scientology I'll save for another day. But the word science is what I'm talking about. We can approach this from quantum physics, the same, these, and, and we will touch on it. These same principles, these same concepts. As Hannah reminded me, I want to go to your questions in just a couple of more minutes. So you may want to begin to compose those in your mind. And if you can put them in the chat box, that helps you to... Uh, be more concise and consolidate your thoughts simply focus get some focus as you put your question or your comment into the chat box and we'll go to those questions in just a couple of minutes so this is why i say that emotional intelligence is the portal to spiritual development because we have to learn to manage our emotions, especially the negative emotions that drive us crazy and drag us into our animal nature and reinforce the belief that buying stuff and acquiring stuff will help and that ultimately we are alone and separate and it's a lie. It's a false impression that is created by presumptions you make when you see an object with these organs called the eyes and you hear a sound with these organs called the ears and you smell and you taste and oh yes we've already mentioned reaching out for that touch boy that makes it real do i see what i think i see do i hear what i think i'm hearing if only i could reach out and touch it boy that would validate it but the touch, the sight, the sound, the, the aroma, the flavor, all of that is in your head. And then project it out into the world. I see a bookcase and it's filled with books. There's something here in terms of energy, but it's no more dense than a snowstorm on a molecular level. I keep saying that because it needs to be said again and again. There's nothing solid about it. It has no objective reality. If you are unaware of it, it does not exist for you. If no one is aware of it, it doesn't exist at all. How much exists in the universe that no one is aware of? Well, quantum physics says about 85%. Dark matter, dark energy, it's invisible, it's unseen, it cannot be touched, it cannot be heard, it cannot be seen, smelled, tasted, and yet 85% of the universe is made up of this invisible dark matter and dark energy. Your dog can hear things you can't hear. Animals smell things you cannot smell. What does the world look like to a creature with... Uh, 50 eyes. I think there's insects with even more than that. A hundred eyes. Uh, creatures that can see 360 degrees around them. Creatures with uh, 
uh, thermal vision, the bats that are basically blind but echolocate and uh, can grab insects out of the air on the fly with, with <laughs> sonar. What's the world look like to them? And then you wonder why we can't get along, why we can't agree. We're all watching different movies, you see. So let's at the very least respond to this divine homesickness, this longing to pursue virtue, to study the mind and to seek the wisdom of the soul. Let that be a threefold mission from this point forward, to pursue virtue as part of our realization that we're not alienated, we're not separated. There's one of us here. There's only one thing at work, a universe, and we're all manifestations or aspects. You're already connected. You're already plugged in. You may not be able to reach it with your hands, see it with your eye, hear it with your ears, smell it or taste it, but you can feel it in your heart. There's just one thing. You are the flower. You are the butterfly. You are the sunny day. You are everything in all things. In a unique vessel, on a path, through virtue, the study of how the mind works, how we've been so fooled and tricked into believing that separated form is all there is. We have to constantly reach out and grab and hold and touch. Even the sense of self we grasp and hold on to, self-grasping ignorance is at the root of the problem. You're not that, you're all of this. Just as we're one body in this class, you see. When we meditate, we enter into the group of all people meditating. Together, let's pursue virtue. What does that mean? What is virtuous? We'll talk about that. Study the mind, its patterns, its habits, its beliefs. It's false assumptions and pursue wisdom. Is there a elevated perspective that we can get to an exalted view of things where, oh, I get it. I see, oh, wow, why am I so worried about this and that? Let's just let it unfold on its own and I'll do you know, whatever adjustments need to be made, I got to take care of business. Oh, time to do the laundry. Guess I got to do the dishes. You know what the Buddha says, chop wood, carry water. Before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. <laughs> you still got to do that stuff. And uh, so we're going to put our feet on that path. We're going to walk from learning to manage our emotions to the pursuit of spiritual virtue, to the study of the mind, and eventually to the wisdom of the soul. If our soul overshadows, as I've suggested, and as the mystical traditions of all time indicate, we ought to be able to contact it. We ought to be able to access that wisdom. But first, let's deal with these animal emotions, all right? Hana? Do we yeah. have questions? Hi there. Yeah, we, I, there is one question, but before that, I wanted to take the liberty of making two comments because um, I'm consistently, um, I don't know, inspired, reminded or whatever. Think of a lot of things in um, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. When I hear you talk, I know you have a lot of respect for Bill W., the floundering father of um, AA. <laughs> and um you know, floundering he was, father and uh, he was a mystic and so in the meditation i caught, thought of a couple of passages in the big book and i just wanted to share it <clears throat> and um and then if you have a comment on it great but it was when you were saying in the meditation you know about like breathing ourselves and things like that and it reminded me of this 
passage in the story called um, Physician Heal Thyself. And there's this doctor and he does this big elaborate surgery and the woman is healing and the husband calls, you know, like a week later to thank him. And, and then he said, after he gets off the phone, he says, he asks himself, what is curing that woman? Yes, I put in those stitches. The great boss gave me diagnostic and surgical talent and he has loaned it to me for use for the rest of my life. It doesn't belong to me. He has loaned it to me and I did my job, but that that end, that end job ended nine days ago. What helped those t- tissues that I closed? I didn't. This is to, this to me is proof of the existence of a somethingness greater than I am. I couldn't practice medicine without that great physician. All I do in a very simple way is help him cure my patients. I think that's really interesting. Like when I think about it like that, it's like the doctor does his thing, but then our bodies heal themselves afterwards, right? And so, and then the other part that I was reminded of um, was when you were talking about praying and um, how, you know, we pray for things to turn out a certain way or to get a certain thing. And um, it, it says this other passage, and then I'll stop. Um, there's a period of meditation and then um, we close it with a prayer. And, but all we pray for is, um, Uh, let's see, I'll just read what it says. We usually conclude the period of meditation with a prayer that we be shown all through the day what our next step is to be, that we be given whatever we need to take care of such problems. We ask especially for freedom from self-will and are careful to make no request for ourselves only. We may ask for ourselves, however, if others will be helped. We are careful never to pray for our own selfish ends. Many of us have wasted a lot of time doing that and it doesn't work. You can easily see why. Because if I'm praying for specific things, I'm sure to be let down because there's a selfishness to that that doesn't include the big picture and what's going on with the rest of the world, right? And also I never know if what I'm being protected from by not getting what I think I want or what I think I need. And usually there's bigger things in store that really my limited uh, consciousness can't even imagine, right? So those are the two things I wanted to share. Thanks. Yes, I feel prayer is very important in terms of standing open and receptive uh, to guidance, strength, and uh, to uh, come from a place of gratitude. Um, there's a medieval mystic, I've forgotten who, uh, who famously wrote, if the only prayer you ever said was one of gratitude, that would suffice. But rather than petitioning, as you said, for, uh, I want this, I want to win the game. I want uh, money. I want that uh, wonderful, loving relationship that is, um, that is, uh, has been eluding me. Um, that's, that's petitioning God. That's where we confuse God with Santa Claus. And what you're doing actually is limiting the possibilities um, as if we know better than God, nature, the universe, the cosmos, the one thing, whatever you want to call it, the absolute, the prime mover, uh, first cause. We've, we've gone over a lot of the alternatives since God, for most of us, conjures up an image of a man on a cloud and that's sort of insulting. In fact, it's idolatry. So if we don't petition uh, for ourselves in, uh, you know, take our shopping list to God, give me this, give me that, what is the point of prayer? It's to align yourself. It's like unkinking the garden hose. It's to stand open and receptive without condition for guidance and strength, for insight and understanding in alignment with this whole idea that we are here to be of service, to to make a contribution. So I wholeheartedly support that view. And, and in that sense, 
I'm not sure there's a distinction, at least for me, in prayer and meditation. Both are very receptive states. They're not only receptive. Um, they do have, there can be causative elements in prayer and meditation, but it's primarily a, a state of receptivity and openness. And again, not, not my will, but thine. Like, let me be a servant. Let me be a vessel. Like, hey, world, what do you want me to do? What should I do? What do you want me? You've given me this life. What, what am I supposed to do with it? Why would I take it and run as if it's only about me? And uh, yeah, I really like that. What else? Anybody else with a comment? Thank you for that, Hannah. Sure. Um, yeah, Melinda says, help me understand the perfection in the natural world in light of natural disasters, plagues, profound and painful illness, etc. Yeah, well, we could go to Darwin. We could start well, with Darwin. Melinda, did you want to add to that oh, or did that sorry. sum it up? <laughs> I just wanted to briefly say it's Meister Eckhart. I Googled it. Ah, uh, thank you. It sounds like something he would say. I wasn't familiar. He lived in 1260, so that was a while ago. I I know Buddhism is big on the life is suffering concept, and and then there's the the gratitude for everything. And there just seems to be a sometimes the best I can do is accept the reality of of things. Uh, and I'll turn it over to you with that question. Well, I mean, you jumped to the answer, didn't you? Um, again, it's judgment where we get in into the problems. Let's take something as simple as rain. Um, we're experiencing here in the West the worst drought in 1,200 years. And it sure would be nice if we had a little bit of rain out here. Meanwhile, the Midwest and the East is flooding. They had to close Yellowstone National Park because of epic floods. I hope that comes down the Colorado and not the Mississippi. We need that. I'm afraid it's going to go the other way, though. Um, I don't know my geography well enough. Is Yellowstone on the east side of the Continental Divide or the west side? I'm not sure, but we could sure use that water. And yet, oh, damn, it rained. I was planning to um, go to uh, the baseball game today, but we got rained out. Um, oh, it rained on my parade. Oh, I've got this nice new um, suede jacket. And if it gets wet, it'll be ruined. Oh no, what a horrible time for it to rain. Uh, and yet rain is a sustenance of life. We can't live without it, right? So whether rain is a good thing or a bad thing is a, an overlay. It's a judgment that we put upon it. Rain is neither good nor bad. It's absurd to talk about it as having value in that way. And so too with an earthquake or a tsunami um, or wildfires. There have always been wildfires. Before there were people on this planet, there were wildfires. Wildfires are necessary for certain kinds of plants to grow. It, it takes a fire. Uh, that's why they do managed burns. But with global warming and climate change, <clears throat> a lot of these so-called managed burns are getting out of hand, getting out of control. And so many of these wildfires have start, been started by, by people that wanted to, you know, create fire breaks and, and controlled burns. Wildfires are not a good thing or a bad thing unless they burn down your house, right? Or kill somebody that, that you love. Um, but the wildfire was here first and the earthquake was here first. 
you've seen Pangea, I'm sure, the, this, this geological understanding that scientists have that at one time all the continents were a single land mask that they've called Pangea and they've drifted. And this creates this tectonic plate friction that um, you know, is compounded by earthquakes. All of this, the result of having a molten core that's really fluid and plastic and, and affected by the gravity of the moon and, and the sun and the earth spinning around and all of these different forces and so we have volcanoes and we have earthquakes and they can be devastating, but they were here before the people were. And so we stand up all indignant and shake our fist at God. And what are you doing with these volcanoes and these earthquakes and these wildfires and these hurricanes? If there were a just God, the hurricane would not have blown down my church. And that's all a problem of personifying God as a micromanager with this big Nintendo controller in the sky. The deists view of this, by the way, many of the founding fathers of America were deists. They were not irreligious, but a deist's view is that God, in a sense, is the creator of the universe, but I don't want to say he, it is immovable, unmoved, and uh, not a participant in our daily life and affairs. It relegates that to you and me and to the animals and the flowers and the plants and the minerals and the clouds and the rivers. And the... that's the manifestation. That's our job. There's not a backup plan we've got, oh, you screwed that up. Oh, that's okay, I got you covered. I got the Nintendo controller here, I'll fix that. And when we petition God, excuse me, I hate to intervene, but my friend has cancer and they're dying. Could you do something about that, right? As if God invented cancer. God didn't invent cancer, human beings invented cancer. The implications of that are pretty profound and I'm not going to go off into that but I think I think you have an understanding of what I'm talking about so we want things to be different than they are better we just learn to cope with things as they are I'm not sure that I'm addressing your question Mindy or your comment but um like we do hear this argument, and I'm sure it occurs to everyone from time to time, if there is a God, then why is there so much injustice in the world? Why do, why do little children die from horrible diseases or car accidents? Or um, why do people suffer so much? Um, what's that line in the... There, there's a line in the movie, Oh God, where John Denver, remember God is portrayed by George Burns, the late George Burns in that movie. And uh, John Denver says he meets God in a restroom, in a bathroom, and they're talking and he says, he puts this question to God. I'm, I'm remembering now. And John Denver says, why do you allow all of this to happen? These earthquakes and these tornadoes and these volcanoes and these floods and these droughts and, and particularly hunger and poverty and starving children and, and disease and, and homelessness and all this gross injustice. Why do you allow it? And George Burns such a brilliant comedian, such an incredible presence on stage, on screen. He started on radio back in the day. 
but his timing is just perfect. And he waits just long enough, pauses just long enough. And then he sort of leans forward toward Joan Denver and says, why do I allow it? You see, <laughs> you want to know why I allow it? And of course, unsaid is, why do you allow it? Why do we put this year alone $785 billion into war while there are 500,000 people sleeping on the streets? Why do, why do we allow it? Uh, in America, the richest country in the world where there are billionaires and billionaires and billionaires, one in five children in America, most of them white, by the way, are food insecure. 20% of our children don't have enough food to eat in America, but will spend $780 billion every single year on war. And we know the cause of climate change, burning fossil fuels, but we're upset that the cost of those fuels are going up. By the way, um, 97 countries have higher gas prices than the United States. I don't know why nobody is saying this. All these pundits and commentary, commentators on the, on the news were just below the 50% line in terms of uh, having the most affordable gas in the world. It's 11, well, they don't use gallons in Europe, but if, if, you, if you equated their leader system to gallons, it's $11 a gallon in England right now. Michael. Um, all across Europe, much more expensive than here. Yeah. I apologize. I have to leave right at 1230 and I have one more question that it's tucked into my chat. So I want to share that with you if I may. Sure. And thank um, you for your help and uh, sure. we'll see you again soon. Yes. Um, so Bob James says, can Michael expand a little bit on the watcher that sometimes mentioned during meditation, separate from the breather? Is that the soul or something else? Yeah, it is. So is that, does that sum it up for you, the gentleman that asked the question? Uh, that's fine. Add on that? Um, yeah, good enough for now, I guess, until I hear the answer. It's sometimes it's hard to formulate a question and to type it in while I'm still trying to listen, <laughs> you know, when when you're talking about uh, something else. And then you go on to gas prices. So, so I, so, <laughs> so, but that, you have to start with that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's my way of deliberately confusing you. So you'll keep coming back. Maybe he'll get around to answering my question. Um, the watcher, yeah, is the oversoul. It is, of course, uh, the one life, divinity itself, the absolute God is the watcher. It's like um, the eye above the pyramid in Freemasonry and on the back of your dollar bill, that's the all seeing eye. That's the eye of Horus in ancient Egyptian uh, hermetic, hermetic philosophy. The all seeing eye, the everywhere, equally present, the omnipresent, omniscient, um, and all knowing uh, eye. And what upon the letter I, like self, but the E-Y-E -E through which we see that I is what we're talking about as, as the capstone of the pyramid, the, the top, that's divinity itself. So to stand back and be the watcher or the witness in a expanded level of awareness where you're not so busy with activity, with reacting reflexively to um, responding with lower levels of consciousness or diminished awareness. We can expand that awareness. We can elevate our perspective. 
It's like if you go up in a hot air balloon, you just climb the hill outside of town. The higher you go on the hill or floating up in the balloon, the broader are your horizons. And so there is an elevated perspective that comes from meditation and prayer, from deep relaxation and surrender to this idea that you're more than this individual separated self. And so as just as fear and anxiety shatter awareness and make us really stupid, um, a deep relaxation and a feeling of letting go of, of turning things over to the higher power, however you want to, not my will, but thine, however you want to talk about that. Deep relaxation promotes an expanded awareness. And so the view from the mountaintop is the watcher who is more aware by virtue of the fact that he's not busy being the reactor or the participant. And um, so you're the spectator in the stands. You're not playing the game, but you're enjoying the game from the stands. You're enjoying the movie from uh, a nice theater seat or the rock concert or the play on stage from the audience. You don't have to go up on stage and, and play a role and act it out. You can sit back and just enjoy the opera from, <laughs> from the nice seat that you got or the concert or whatever. Um, so that's, that's what I mean by being the, the witness. It also suggests non-judgment and the mindfulness of the present moment. To be a real witness or a watcher is not judging. Because again, when you begin to judge, you create these false dichotomies. Good, bad, right, wrong, could be better. Hope, at least it's not worse, <laughs> whatever. It's just such a limiting view. When you judge, you're putting on the blinders or, or when you're concerned about how it affects you and only you rather than the bigger picture. So, um, it's a conceptual understanding. It's the whole enchilada. It's the elevated view of the witness. That's, does that address your, your question, Bob? Uh, it's enough for now. Let me give it some thought. Good. Good. If there's more, come back. Uh, Hannah does have a 12.30, so she's gone. Um, so I, I got started a little late, so I'm willing to give us a couple of more minutes here. If anybody else has a question or comment, why don't you just speak up, unmute yourself and shout it out. Yes, Michael, it's Patrick. Hello, Patrick. Uh, um, so uh, my sponsor from the AA that I go to, He's been uh, talking with me for the last few years about stepping back and observing my thoughts, staying in the moment. A lot of the principles that I also hear from you, but also the question that the gentleman just brought up reminded me of the watcher, of being able to separate your spirit from your thoughts because the brain's always moving, not always in the best direction. <laughs> right and that's my comment on that and i'm glad to see you and and this is a great show so thank you well thank you patrick what part of the world are you in uh right now i'm back in los angeles so good wonderful uh, the last time i talked to you i was in tulsa so that was right when covid was starting well welcome back in, to los angeles and uh Let's hope uh, now that COVID's had its way with us that it'll fade away for the most part. It'll always be out there. But That's right. Amen. Yeah. Amen, indeed. A good place to end. Thank you, Bob, and or, or Patrick and Bob and Hannah. And um, each of you for being here. Uh, again, um, given... The, given my intention to 
stop doing the radio program. This is going to be even more important in my life. And uh, I'm always looking to grow this and develop this. And this is posted on my YouTube channel. And uh, I think when I stop doing the radio program, what I'll do is podcast this class without the meditation and without the Q&A, just podcast the middle and invite my podcast listeners to join us live if they want to participate with the Q&A or if they want to enjoy the meditation. I'm concerned about podcasting a meditation because so many people are driving cars um, or as they say, operating heavy machinery. <laughs> when the meditation comes up, it's not a good idea. I don't want to be responsible for somebody being even more spaced out than usual, listening to a meditation while they're driving a car. So I think I'll edit the front and back off. And uh, the YouTube will be the full video in its entirety. But the podcast, I think I'll just do the, the middle. Anyway, just let you in on my process and and my plans for the future. Hopefully you'll continue to be here live every Sunday morning at 11, whenever possible. Again, I wish you all a happy Father's Day and I wish your fathers and their fathers and their fathers a happy Father's Day. And, um, and I guess that's pretty much it. I don't really have any other announcements. I just want you to know how much I value your presence. I invite you to unmute and say goodbye to each other, and we'll see you next Sunday. Namaste, aloha, salam. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye, everybody. Bye.